Hey, Sun here, I'm a privacy and a security researcher and you're watching the Privacy Guides. Today's episode is here in the lab as the old episodes were. I wanna talk about what has changed in my setup and this is the 2023 edition. A lot of you have been asking a lot of questions in the comments and I actually read all of your questions. I don't have time, unfortunately, to answer to all of them, um, but I do see them. So this episode is kind of an attempt at answering uh, some of them and kind of keeping you guys up to date as to, uh, yeah, what has changed. So I have a list here because there's a lot and I need notes for this one. So if I'm looking down, that's what I'm looking at. Um, so I'll start by saying that I am now using a MacBook Air M2 and that's the computer I use for my personal stuff and for work. Um, there's this whole dichotomy of, you know, wanting more privacy and security uh, and then trading off a lot of convenience. As you know, now I'm working on Superbacked. Uh, I'm doing a lot of advocating. I've been giving talks about that. So I kind of have to find balance. So that MacBook Air M2, um, I'm pretty happy with it. Some of you ask, son, do you still recommend, you know, using 2015 Max? Um, well, I'm really sad that uh, Tails, for instance, doesn't run on M1 Max or M2 Max. Um, that said, a lot of what was preventing me from upgrading to the Apple Silicon has been kind of improved upon, uh, one of which is uh, Little Snitch could not work um, as it was intended before some patches were done by Apple. Um, and, you know, I was really worried about can I spoof my Mac address uh, on M1 or M2? Uh, and yes, you can. So Little Snitch works as one would want. Uh, and it's also possible to spoof the Mac address. Um, there's also some new features that are pretty cool. So I kind of want to talk really briefly about, uh, you know, my hardened Mac OS Ventura setup. Uh, so I use a really strong password. I enable file vault. I enable lockdown mode. I only enable system customization and significant locations uh, as far as location services goes. And that is required for uh, battery management. If you don't enable these things, the computer will always charge to 100%. Um, it doesn't always work, as I mentioned in one of the previous episodes, but I'm at least that's what Apple says one has to do. Um, Sun of the Future here. I'm actually editing the episode and I completely forgot to mention that I enable the firewall in stealth mode. And uh, although that can break some network connectivity at home and stuff, it's really important, especially when you're out there in the wild with your computer. And I also require the password when the computer wakes from sleep. And there's a whole episode about this. I'll link uh, it down there in the description. Now, um, obviously, and I can already hear some of you cringing, uh, I also use other computers because no, Mac and Apple is not like something that we should blindly trust. I think this computer is a great compromise, but at best it's a compromise uh, for this. I actually use um, a ThinkPad, and this here is actually a Gen 6. What's really cool with the Gen 6 is that we can actually remove the uh, well, all wireless interfaces physically, as well as the hard drive. What that means is when this computer uh, is used, it cannot communicate with the internet because it doesn't have the hardware to do so. I know this can be disabled in the BIOS for future ThinkPads, but I really like the fact that I can actually physically remove it which is something I miss in new computers. Now I use the ThinkPad X1 Carbon Gen 6. Uh, and by the way, I also have a, a ThinkPad X1 Yoga Gen 3, both of which are the last that one can remove physically the wireless interfaces from. So maybe I'll create a whole episode on this. This is actually a good segue to say, please use the comments to kind of upvote topics that you would like me to create full episodes on. This is really just a high level perspective on what has changed and me trying to answer some of your questions. But yeah, if you have other questions, drop them in the comments. Uh, and if you want me to create a specific episode, drop them in the comments and using the like feature of comments, like the topics that you would like me to create episodes on. Um, so yeah, I use the ThinkPad X1 Carbon Gen 6 for air gapped use cases, uh, specifically on Tails OS or Superbacked OS. Um, and yeah, I've created a whole bunch of episodes about Tails. I'll explain a little more in this episode why I use Tails for. 
Um, now, I also use um, a Raspberry Pi. So this here is actually my full node. Whoop, can this focus? Hmm, yeah. Sorry about this. So uh, this is a Raspberry Pi 4. It is running a version of Debian um, that is kind of hardened on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, and what's really cool about this is it's actually using a Samsung T7 Touch uh, to enable hardware layer encryption. And this here is my little uh, Bitcoin full node because if you know anything about Bitcoin, if you want some privacy, you need to have your own full node. And I created a whole bunch of episodes on the topic. Um, and this is a good segue to saying that if you want to support this work, uh, please consider donating uh, and you can donate using Bitcoin or Libra pay if you have a credit card. Uh, and that's why I ended up setting up my own full node and stuff. Um, I also use a cold card MK4. This here is what I use for key management in the context of Bitcoin donations. It's a really cool device. Um, it's, I believe, uh, the right compromise between, you know, transparency and source code that's auditable um, and good, you know, hardware manufacturing. It's not the most secure, but it's not the weakest. I could create a whole episode on this actually, and I have created one, which I'll link down there in the description. Um, okay, now I also use Electrum. Uh, Electrum is an app uh, that is Bitcoin centric. That's what I use to manage donations. Um, now, as far as other devices go, I actually still use an iPhone SE with a little rubber band here to mask the cameras. What I really like about the iPhone SE is that it does not require face ID. It does require biometric. Um, we can mask the cameras because there's this big black area there where there's no screen. That's something that I'm finding really hard. I mean, this here, kind of spoiler alert, this here is a Pixel 5. I'll talk about it in a second, but I have to put all kinds of those little stickers, uh, which is kind of obnoxious and they fall off. This here is kind of like a more uh, resilient option. By the way, one of you recommended this in the comments, so thanks for this. Um, so yeah, iPhone SE for personal and work. Um, I also kind of hardened iOS to some level. There's not much we can do, but I use a strong password and not a pin. Never use a pin because people can really easily memorize it and then kind of steal <laughs> your digital identity on the phone. It's really scary. The Wall Street Journal published something really interesting on this, which I'll link down there in the description. Um, and it, it erase data is enabled. So if the wrong pin or passphrase is entered, in my case, it's a passphrase, uh, the wrong passphrase is entered. Um, yeah, it will kind of nuke itself. Uh, lockdown mode enabled. Um, and again, system customization and significant, uh, significant locations uh, are the only location services enabled uh, for battery management. Now I do allow Google Maps and I can hear some of your cringe too. Um, I do use Google Maps, but I only give it my location when I explicitly need it. And that's something that one should do for all apps. So really make sure that only, you know, apps when you're using them can access location. Everything else is not allowed. Um, now again, I don't fully trust Apple or iOS or Mac OS. So I also have a Pixel 5 running Graphene OS. That's the device I use for uh, private conversations, uh, actually super backed uh, signal customer support is actually done on this device. Uh, and that's a device that is way more hardened than any, you know, iOS device. So I really like the Pixel 5 for this and Graphene uh, OS, which is which is a really nice, uh, you know, work of love in some ways uh, for us to have an Android uh, ROM that we can just install. And that is really, really well thought out. Um, okay, as far as password managers go, a lot of you have asked, son, uh, you know, one password has changed. You can no longer do local sync. Um, so yeah, I have switched to KeePass XC for a while. And I mean, man, I have pro been procrastinating on creating an episode on the topic. KeePass XC is actually the default password manager in the context of Tails OS. It is ridiculously well engineered, open source, and you can actually use a YubiKey uh, such as this one here. So you can use a YubiKey uh, as some kind of an HMAC uh, to even strengthen that encryption even more and also to have some level of forward secrecy. That means that each time the, the vault is saved, uh, the uh, you know cryptograph uh, crypto crypt cryptographic material um, is changed ever so slightly. So if someone can breach the encryption key, they won't be able to breach it, you know, 
uh, the next time and the next time around each time you save. Um, and given I have an HMAC on this that I have configured, um, I need a backup for it because if I lose the YubiKey, I'm doomed. And that's really where Superback shines. I use Superback uh, for backing up that HMAC secret. Um, now, I use YubiKey Authenticator for time-based two-factor authentication or 2FA, you know, those six-digit tokens. Uh, YubiKey Authenticator is a really cool open source app and it actually stores the secrets on the YubiKey and that is really, really good. I mean, that means that you can kind of air gap in some ways keys from the computer. It's kind of like using a hardware wallet in the context of Bitcoin, but uh, it also means you need to have backups and that is actually why I created the uh, you know, QR code scanning feature in Superback so that you can back up the TOTP key material using Superback. Uh, by the way, you can also do this using KeePass XC on Tails if you have an air gapped computer. For my use case, as I'm developing, you know, sensitive technology and uh, I'm really careful, I actually manage all of this on Tails air gapped. So all of the provisioning is done of, of those, you know, TOTP. Um, apps is done on Tails uh, away from my daily driver. Why? Because uh, I don't want this daily driver, if ever it was to be compromised, to be able to screen capture the QR code and then be able to issue those six digit tokens, you know, in the future. So that specific stuff is done on Tails. It does connect to the internet. That's just how it works. Uh, because you need to get the QR code, but at the same time, it's done on a computer that has very little attack surface compared to my daily driver Mac. Um, now, I use a hardened version of Firefox and I use Malvad uh, DNS over HTTPS. There's a whole episode on the topic on that new setup. I'll link to it down there in the description. Um, I'm still liking Firefox a lot. I know it's not perfect by any means, but it works very well. And uh, given I'm now using Malvad uh, DNS over HTTPS, I've been using the Malvad VPN less and less. That probably merits its own episode. I think there's a lot of hype on everyone should be using a VPN. Uh, most people don't, and there is like a rationale, rationale behind that. And yeah, probably that will make uh, it to its own episode. Let me know in the comments if you're pumped about that one. Um, so I am using Malvad uh, VPN once in a while for specific use cases. Sometimes you need to be in a different location. Sometimes you want a little more privacy. For more privacy, one should always use Tor browser, but the VPN is very useful. As a matter of fact, uh, this node will actually connect uh, true Malvad, and that's one of the reasons why I'm still using Malvad, to Tor and then to other nodes, and that is done in a way so that if ever this uh, Raspberry Pi node was to be connected in a country that does not allow Tor, it will connect to the VPN first and route all of that Tor traffic through the VPN. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, as far as email goes, I've been using Proton Mail and Proton Calendar for some time. It actually works very well. It is not perfect by any means. Uh, and I have talked about that a lot on the channel. I'll link an episode down there in the uh, description. But it's kind of like a, a good enough compromise. And to be clear, I actually handle my uh, PGP keys on my YubiKey, you know. So again, this is something that is really important. Um, and again, you need to back them up. And that's why I use Tails and Superbacked. Um, what that means is when I want to, you know, encrypt an email, well, I have a choice. Either if it's not too, you know, sensitive, I can use Proton, especially when interacting with other Proton users, that's very, you know, very seamless because it's end-to-end -end encrypted. But for stuff that's more sensitive, my public key is actually published on sunnewton.com and referenced on GitHub. And that means that if you want to write an email to me, you can use that pub key. And the private key for that is on a YubiKey, not this one actually, but the one on my keychain. So let me just kind of mask things here. Uh, this is a good segue. Let me see, good segue to saying that this here is my keychain and I have a YubiKey and a Samsung bar flash drive. And this is with me at all times. I'll explain more about the uh, Samsung bar drive in a second. Um, and by the way, I always have those keys with me at all times because those keys allow me to access my encrypted cloud backups 
and it also allows me to you know access my digital identity so it's something that i want to have close to me if ever the house is on fire or something i can just grab it and run um so yeah proton calendar and proton mail has been very useful as i'm running a business now i need to have calendar invites i need to uh, you know schedule more and more stuff and it's actually a good enough compromise the app for calendar was not on ios for a very long time but now it is and the experience is you know acceptable um i use signal for messaging uh and you know can't recommend it enough in the context of graphene os one can actually install signal from an apk and use Signal's push notification system to really not touch Google or touch it as little as possible, which is really cool. Uh, same for uh, Proton, by the way, you can install the Proton app on Graphene OS, but uh, you won't get push notifications unless that has changed. Uh, yeah, so uh, I also use sparse encrypted rsync backups to my Samsung bar. So as I showed, this little USB flash drive has encrypted backups for all of my key material um, so keypass XC, Borg key files, keychain, etc. cetera. Uh, and then obviously for important reasons, I have cloud backups, but they're not the regular cloud backups that people tend to have. So it's not a question of using, you know, Google Drive or Dropbox like I used to in the past. I actually use a thing called Borg. So Borg backups is amazing. It encrypts the data on the computer itself. Um, and it also optimizes, you know, space and does a whole bunch of cool stuff. And those backups are, are backed up on rsync.net in a data center that's uh, actually in Switzerland, so under good uh, privacy law. And sennudsen.com is hosted at 1984 in Iceland. That has not changed. Whew! That was a lot. So, yeah, I wanted to kind of give you guys a status update because some of you were asking, you know, about one password, about am I still using, you know, older versions of Mac OS? Is it okay to update? Um, now, as always, this is very nuanced. Uh, if you ask questions down there, you know, uh, in, in the comments, I'll, I'll try to answer a few of them, especially if they're upvoted using likes. Um, but yeah, yeah, exciting times. I mean, I actually, uh, won an emerging entrepreneur contest, which I'm not allowed to talk about because it's not public yet. Um, but I'll be bringing you along for one hell of a ride in the upcoming weeks. Uh, so that's all I have for you today. I'll see you soon. Bye.